All right. So what are we talking about today? Well, this is a topic that you invented, you, sort of. Yeah, you kind of invented this, and you asked me about it, and that's what we're talking about. <laughs> okay. We've been calling it um, the first one in the game phenomenon. Yeah, the, I, the first one in the game effect, uh, Okay. which is a thing that we've made up, but I think it's really fascinating. Um, so here's what it is. I have noticed that I have a group of friends that I play co-op games with every week or so. And what we'll usually do is we'll pick a game, Don't Starve or Terraria or something like that. It's just a, a game that we're all going to play together. Uh, and it's just this cooperative thing that we all hang out and play. And we'll pick a new game and we'll say, okay, on Thursday night, we're going to try out this new game. And what will happen usually is that one of us happens to be the first one to get into the game. Maybe, but let's say Alex is the first one in the game. He downloaded it beforehand and everyone else is waiting on it to finish downloading or everybody's getting snacks, prepared, something. For whatever reason, he'll load up the game first. And what happens is he is the only one there, so he has no one to ask questions or you know even talk to about it. He's just on his own trying to figure out how stuff works. You know, he's opening up menus and figuring out how you equip a weapon or put on armor or how do you move, stuff like that. And say 10 or 20 minutes later, uh, everyone else starts showing up, getting into the game. So what, what would you think would happen there? I mean, ignore the fact that we have talked about this and we, we know what happens. Well, like, how the, would you the players, the players that are starting to trickle in um, they don't really know what's going on, so they ask the first person that's in there. Yeah, Alex. They say, "Alex, how do I create a character? How do I?" Right. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And what I would have expected before I started observing this and thinking about it is that you know Alex had to figure out all this stuff on his own, so it takes a little while, and he's you know kind of wasting time, quote unquote, opening menus and sorting stuff out like that. Uh, and so everyone else who gets in has a bit of an advantage and that they can just ask him questions. They don't have to figure it out themselves. And in theory, they ought to catch up pretty quickly. You know, he, he can tell them what to do. They, they get up to speed. And then within a half hour, hour or so, everybody's on more or less equal playing ground and they're, they're off to it. But that is not what happens. What happens usually is that Alex will be the expert in that game forever. He will be the, the one who's best at it, the one who knows what's going on more so than anyone else. And it will stay like that forever for however many hours you put into this game. And that is, that is what we're calling the first one in the game effect. So why do you think that is? Why doesn't it go away after that initial first part of knowledge is shared? Well, I think that this thing that happens that... I, I've played a lot of games. We've done this many times. I really didn't notice it until years later. I think this thing is very important. Uh, we'll, we'll try to sort out what exactly is happening. But we floated this question uh, early on in the show, how it's weird that if you take a bunch of people and you tell them to learn how to do something, you know, say you give them all guitars and say, hey, go home and practice guitar for half an hour every day and they come back, some of them will be really good at it, you know, relative to people having played guitar for a week, and some of them will suck and they will be hardly any better than when they first touched it. And it's weird that people can have this wildly different experience learning something. And this effect, I'm not saying it's the answer to that, but I think it's a major piece of the puzzle to why that, that happens. So that's the the thing that I, I want to try and answer, like why does this happen sometimes and what does it mean? So you're asking why. Uh, I think what happens is that the first person in the game, because they have no one to ask questions to, they have to figure things out. That's just, they have to, or else they just won't learn anything. So they just start doing stuff, you open menus, start clicking things, start moving around. You walk into something and it kills you and you go, okay, well, that thing kills me and I got to not do that. And you just start figuring stuff out. That's the mindset that you have to have if you're the first one there. For everyone else, it feels like a waste of time 
to do dumb stuff and start clicking around trying to find something when you can just ask the first person who already has figured this stuff out and you say, hey, how do I do that? Uh, so they do. I mean, it's a pretty obvious scenario. The first person in figures stuff out for themselves. Everyone else asks that first person questions. It's exactly what makes sense to do. But I think what happens is when you have a new experience, when you're, when you're learning how to do something new, the way you approach that thing is completely blank. Like you don't, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know how to figure things out. You're just kind of unsure of anything. And certain things kind of crystallize as soon as you get in. If you get put into this mindset of, oh, I figure stuff out by trying stuff then that's, that's your way of interacting with that game. If you get put into this mindset of, I figure stuff out by asking someone else what to do, that's your mindset. And those approaches can just kind of stick, sometimes forever, in the way you actually play this game. And when you have the mindset of somebody who just does stuff, does, does things and figures it out for themselves, uh, you are very quick to try new ideas. You're very quick to develop a more fundamental understanding of how things works or how things work. Whereas if you're just asking questions, a lot of times you aren't really wrestling with how do these things really work. You aren't thinking about, should I try this or should I try that? You just have a problem. You ask the question, you get the solution. And you tend not to like really grapple with some of those more fundamental things and develop this deeper understanding of what you're doing does that make sense it makes sense to me yeah i've noticed in my entire life there are certain things that i i will never pursue or i will never ever even attempt to try and figure out say if something goes wrong with my car there's no way that mm -hmm. i'm opening the hood and looking at it. like forget it. i will pay any amount of money to have someone else look at it <laughs> I will never deal with that ever. And it's always been that way because uh, I grew up being not the first one in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. You were probably the first one in the game for that. Um, or, or dad. So dad or you would go look at my car. So I never, ever had a need to figure out how to deal with my car. And it has stuck with me ever since. Um, yeah. When I bought a car, I had it in my head i want this 1989 camaro and my plan is to take this old car and fix it up and i had absolutely no idea what i was doing i had never worked on or done anything with a car before but i figured the car is cheap and parts are pretty cheap so i'll just do stuff and figure it out and i right. i did have people to talk to you know I, I could ask dad questions and he had some experience with working on cars but mostly I didn't do that. Mostly I just tried stuff and I actually broke things and, and made a mess with the car, but I just had this mentality of this is my car and I got to take care of it. Right. And I, I definitely did not have that because if anything right. went wrong with my car, I'd just say, Hey, what's wrong with it? Yeah. And I, I never thought twice about that. Right. Yeah. So I think it, I think that's a perfect like example of how that so affected us. Do you think, you should always be in that mindset, always be the one trying to figure out what to do. But because I think your, your brain is trying to do the least amount of work to get the most mm -hmm. information. And so if there is someone you can just ask, that's the easiest way to get that knowledge. It, it's probably what you should do, but it does, it, it can become a problem. I think with the, the game example, which is where I first recognized this, we play games for fun and they're usually pretty casual games. So mostly the point is to get on and hang out and we're all on, you know, voice chat. So we just kind of talk and, and it's fun to figure out a game together and stuff like that. So some of us, we're not trying to be good at the game. They're literally cooperative games. It's not a competition. Right. So the idea of just getting in and asking around and, and figuring out what to do and then just going through it, that's, the goal is fine. You know, there's no need to be the best at that game, but it's a phenomenon that is very interesting. And in certain cases, very, very powerful. It can shape the way you, 
like you said, you never really learned a whole lot about cars. I learned a lot about them because we just had a completely different mentality when it came to cars. You, I'm going to guess, don't care. You're, I do not know. Right. Like your goal was not to learn a lot about cars, so it's fine. Uh, but there are certain areas where it's really important and it affects us a lot. Well, I mean, I, I definitely wish I had picked up some of that um, now. So I, I, I do care. Okay. I definitely didn't care then. So I, I wish I did have some of that knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and I guess my point is recognizing that this is a thing that happens and recognizing why it happens is probably pretty critical if you care at all about learning about a car or not, or it will we'll kind of move into this. How does this apply to something like you learning to play music or being an artist or something like that? You know, there sometimes you really do want to be good at something and the elements that come into play with that initial experience of how do I approach this, that can shape your whole trajectory there. Right. Well, it definitely did play into how I became an artist. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, how, how do you think that fits there? Okay, well, when I first started getting into it, there was no one else that I knew that did that. So it was all me. Every book that I bought, every decision I made was all up to me. All the mm -hmm. problem solving. Anytime I got a, a job, um, anytime I got like a commission or something, any of those problems that I faced... It was up to me to figure it out. And it, it definitely filled me with a lot of confidence. Um, yeah. You know, after, after solving the problems, maybe not during it, but uh, it was certainly very good and beneficial for, for me to do that. What's interesting, though, looking back now, once I got my job, that flipped. I was no longer the, the first one in the game. I was mm -hmm. no longer looking at it uh, that way. There was a, a senior artist that I sat next to, and he had been in the industry or has been in the industry for over 50 years. Um, so he, he is very, very good. And I, only looking back do I realize this, but I stopped trying to solve all the problems that I got my way and started looking at the way he would do things and try to solve them the way he was doing them. And that, that doesn't really makes sense. There were times I could ask him questions mm -hmm. about things. Um, but it actually, it's, it started turning into um, sort of like an inferiority complex where I just never felt good enough because no matter how good I did, I yeah. could never be as good as him. Um, I don't know. It, it, it was a totally different way of approaching things. Well, why do you, th in that scenario, it sounds like that worked out well for you, right? No, I, I mean, it, this was mostly just at the beginning. There's right. probably a little bit of it still left over, but uh, that was the, the big switch. Yeah. Yeah, to me, the, the first one in the game effect is a, a very real thing, and you see it play out a lot. Uh, but... Uh, the conclusion, if that were the whole the whole story, is that you should never have a teacher or ask anyone for help ever. And that no. clearly isn't the way. So there's there's more going on than just that. I think we acknowledge that teachers are useful at least sometimes. Well, maybe we haven't totally explained it uh, well enough. But the, for me, the first one in the game would be just an, an attitude towards solving problems in this this interest or this genre yeah. of things uh to where you're you're not going to wait on anyone else to to solve these things you, you're going to be the one that's responsible for for dealing with these problems and you can ask people you can figure it out by yourself you can you'll you'll do whatever it takes to solve that problem but you're not going to wait around for someone else to tell you how to do it yeah you're going to figure it out yourself but uh, you can always ask for help and you can get teachers and everything, but it's that attitude towards, towards that, that, that for me is what I, I keep calling, or we keep calling the first one in the game. Yeah. It's more of a, a mentality or an approach uh, yeah. that you wind up with. So 
one area where I've seen this happen. And there's, there's been quite a few, but there's... You'll see a lot of older folks talk or joke about, you know, technology and how they're, they're lost or, you know, I don't know how computers work. And there's a, almost like an ageism thing there of the younger generation. You know, we grew up with computers. We know how to do it. And if you're older and you didn't grow up with it, then you can be a bit lost and not really know how to interact with technology. And I can think of specific people that have this exact thing going on. But it isn't just a generally a generational thing because there are plenty of older people who are brilliant with computers. They're software engineers, they're building, you know, incredible pieces of tech. They're, you know, as well versed as anyone in that field. So it, it clearly is not just a age thing, right? Right. And I I dislike accusing or pointing to age as a factor because it's I don't think in this scenario it's at all about how old you are in an absolute sense. Like, oh, my brain is different now. It's hardened up and it can't, that, that doesn't, that's not a real thing. At least I don't think it is. Uh, what happens is the circumstance that you're put into is different. Where if right. you're older and you haven't, when you're younger and you get a computer or you get a phone or you get to use your family's computer, I know for me, I never asked anybody anything. I didn't read manuals or anything like that. I just did stuff and broke stuff and didn't care that I was breaking stuff. If you see a button, you click on it. You see what happens. Like you just explore, try everything. I remember getting one of the early Macs that had a graphical interface as a kid. I remember just opening up the applications and going through each one and just trying to figure out what is on this computer, what can I do in this computer, you know, what are the settings? What's what's deep inside of it or as deep as you can go? Uh, you know, I that's just how I happen to approach it. And some people, especially if you did not have that mindset when you're younger, you're looking for instruction. You're looking to be taught the right way to do it. You're looking for a manual. You're looking for, you know, okay, what is the proper way to do this? Or how, how do I interact with this? I would see that right. all the time uh, teaching music to adult students. They were... Right had this extreme uh, hesitance to just put their fingers on the instrument and play and see what happens. You know, a kid, it, because, you can't get them to shut up. They're just, they won't stop. Because the, the adult feels like they're behind, right? They, they should have started this when they were younger. They, they don't feel they're ahead, right? I think so, that, Why do you think it, it is that it's, it's more adults that are afraid to do that? I think afraid that afraid to make mistakes. Adults it sounds weird. Adults have feelings about it and kids don't. A kid, if you put a guitar in their hands, they just start hitting it. They start making sound. It it can be hard to get them to stop so you can say anything. I mean, they just they just do it. There's no usually there isn't this sense of, "Oh, am I being inappropriate or was that the wrong way?" They just they don't think about it. They don't care. An adult if you think about the experience of an adult versus the experience of a child, an adult is somebody who has a job, usually, and they're usually competent at it. They at least can appear that way. They wind up in social situations where they know what to do. They've been there before. They know how to talk with you. They know the right things to do. They can go into a restaurant and order food. Like They're pretty adept at dealing with day-to-day -day life. Uh, and a kid is not. Everything is new to them. They're thrown into school. They have no idea what's going on. They don't know how to interact, interact with people. They're still learning the language. They're still, everything is new. They're constantly put in these embarrassing, they don't know how to handle it type situations. And that's just their life. I mean, it has to be. They, they're just, they're young. They haven't really done a lot yet. So right. giving them a guitar and saying, okay, we're going to learn something new. That's just the, that's their day to day. But an adult, putting them in that scenario can be very uncomfortable because they are not used to that at all. They aren't going to school and having to start out as an absolute rank beginner at, at something and learning the basics of physics or, you know, the alphabet, anything. Like, they just don't have that experience very often. So it creates this 
hesitance that they have where they just don't want to do that. They don't want to do things wrong. They never do things wrong. They're a professional, they're an adult, and they just have this, this persona. And that seems okay, but it winds up creating this, this thing. It's very similar to the, the first one in the game effect where they, they want to feel like they're doing, thing, doing things right. So they ask a question, they look for an answer, they look for the proper way to do it, and then they do it that way. They don't just explore and try stuff and break things and just see how it works, or a kid will do that. And very, very often you'll see a kid progress much better than an adult because they have that, that mindset. And they usually right. blame it on age. Say, well, you know, kids learn fast and adults don't. And that just isn't true. Uh, it's just, it creates a different mentality. So, well, adults versus kids. You have adults that have kind of formed this, this approach to things through many years of, of probably a normal routine, going to work, you know, doing mm -hmm. their, their daily things where they're pretty confident in what they're doing. And then you have the kids who are pretty new to everything and they just have this mentality of do it and figure it out as you go, I guess. Right. But right. Th this all happens over a pretty long period of time. But something like the, the game that you guys do, it's dependent on the first person that goes into that. It's not really dependent on if they're old or young or anything. It's more right. of like a, an instant decider. Um, so do you think, I guess what I'm asking, do you think you can overcome that sort of adult mentality in, in any new subject? Yeah. I guess. Well, I, th I think my point with talking about age differences is that we blame the wrong thing for this effect uh, where somebody who's younger can sometimes appear to learn a lot faster than somebody who's older. Uh, and it's not about the age, not directly. It's sort of an indirect effect where your age and circumstance can create this different mentality in the way you approach something. Uh, like I said before, you get this really wide range of, of skill development with different people. And it, trying to answer that question of why you get such a wide difference is I think important, and this is part of the answer, is that when you take your initial steps in something, you, without even realizing it, you formulate your approach to this thing. How am I going to, how am I going to do this? Where is my new information gonna come from? That can happen if you're, you know, an adult picking up guitar for the first time or a kid or you're getting into a PC game or working on your car or anything. Uh, there are little factors that can formulate this mentality or this approach that you have to this thing you're trying to learn and they can drastically affect the outcome or your trajectory in learning that thing. And I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you, if you were conscious of your approach to something and your mentality, then you have the opportunity to change it. And if you know what a better approach is, you should try to change it to that if you're interested in learning that thing. You know, if, if you wanted to learn how to fix your car, what you should do is just go work on your car. You know, don't... So, well, I, I have a dumb example, but not only am I very awful with cars i'm also really bad with electronics and you know any of those engineering type things uh -huh. i'm just awful that's that's why i draw things all day instead of do that but a little <laughs> while ago um actually i think when we started this show i i wanted to start i don't know not being so close-minded to other things <laughs> so my microwave broke right okay it actually i mean it just you know <laughs> huge, not huge explosion, but you know, flashed light and any explosion is right. something. Okay, a tiny, tiny, scary explosion. And my first thought was, okay, I'm buying a new microwave. I mean, there's no way I'm gonna look at this thing and figure out what went wrong. I don't want to deal with that uh, uncomfortableness of yeah of not knowing what to do uh, or feeling insecure. 
I'm just going to drop a couple hundred bucks, buy a new microwave and call it a day. Yeah. But then I was, I don't know. I just, how about we do things differently today? <laughs> so I, I took, I started taking the microwave apart. Oh, it, instead of treating it, treating it like, oh, my microwave broke and I'm just going to buy a new one. I decided to treat it like, oh, I wonder why my microwave broke. It was, it was a okay. very subtle difference, but it, it made a big difference. So I started researching, trying to figure out what other people had experienced with the same thing and whatever. Anyway, I took the whole thing, not the whole thing. I took a little bit of it apart. And um, turns out there was a fuse blown. I replaced the fuse and the whole thing worked again. I, I think I spent five bucks on the on a pack of fuses. Congratulations. A, nice a very job. common, simple problem. Well, that, yeah. But, uh, you know, this was kind of a big deal for me to to tackle something on electronic. I just, normally I would say absolutely not. Just spend the money, get a new one, avoid the horribleness of dealing with something like that. But I solved it and I actually kind of enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I, I just decided to treat it a, a little bit differently. Um, so it, I think that would be an example of how I've had 30 years of me saying no to these types of things. Mm -hmm. I just decided to treat it a little bit differently and I was able to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a little problem. But I don't give myself too much credit, but I did it. But it wasn't a little problem at first. It was this infinite space of all kinds of problems that it could have been, then you have no idea. Right. But you open it up and look into it and go, oh, it's just a fuse. I just get a new fuse. And I imagine if your coffee pot broke in a month or two, you might think, it might just be the fuse. I should right. check that. I did. Right? <laughs> Yes, I've already blamed a few other electronic things on fuses. <laughs> now, any anytime something goes wrong, I'm like oh, the fuse is probably blown. Um, <laughs> well, it could be. But, yeah, but now, it's like now you have an in. Yes, you, know, you can open yeah. up the coffee pot and go. Oh well, it wasn't the fuse. It was this other thing. Uh, right. Although I will say this as a cautionary tale, I <laughs> attempted to fix my coffee pot, which I had done a few times, and it was fine, but. I guess I got the wrong fuse or something. I don't know. But the fuse had blown for a reason. And and I put one in that didn't blow. So there's this big aluminum heating element inside the coffee pot. And it it's a pretty substantial heater. It you know boils the water and sends it up through the thing. Uh, it got so hot that it melted. Not the plastic, the aluminum. And so it leaked this pool of molten lava down onto the table and like spread out in this liquefied aluminum thing and it didn't burn the house down but it should have maybe i'll think twice about fixing just, electronic things <laughs> yeah there is a potential downside to just try stuff and break things but anyway congrats on fixing your microwave that's great thank you thank you yeah. be a little bit careful with the coffee pot <laughs> but i just i wanted to use it as an example of it it may not be that I'm just so terrible that my brain doesn't work with those types of things like electronics and cars and everything. Mm -hmm. It's that I've just approached it completely wrong for a very very long time. Yeah, Th this that that right there is is something that I guess you could call it a pet peeve. I hate that we invoke the I call it the magic explanation for for things so often. Uh, where you people will say, "Oh, my brain just doesn't work that way." Um, yes, it does. It, your your brain is just fine. It, you're not. <laughs> Here's an example. We talked about this actually a little bit, I think, on the last one. But if you want to learn a language as an adult, you know, you, you may go to school and try to learn it, and it's hard. It's actually very hard. I took two semesters of Spanish in college and I didn't learn anything. And the explanation that you usually hear, if if you were to point out that, man, it's frustrating to me that I've worked really hard learning Spanish, but a small child is able to learn it. Always, actually. I mean, every kid, unless there's, you know, something really wrong, every kid learns to speak their language that they grew up with. Uh, always. 
right? You don't have 15 year olds right. walking around who can't speak and you go, ah, well, it just didn't stick with them. Their brain just doesn't work that way. They couldn't quite pick up on language, right? Like we don't think that way at all. Guaranteed, you will learn a language if you're exposed to it as a child. But as an adult, if you try to take it at, in a class, uh, very, very often you won't learn it or you'll learn very, very little. And the right. explanation is again, the magic of, well, kids have brains that just learn languages. Their, their brains are different. We don't know how sponge brain. Yeah. Yeah. They get up. Yeah. Right. There's something magical about their brains and adult brains are different. And what we don't really recognize is that the way a child learns a language is way, way different than the way we teach it in school. They don't study grammar. They don't do any of, they don't take tests on it. They don't do any of the things that we do in school. They have this vastly different approach to it where they have it spoken to them in very, very simple terms. And they, people use body language to communicate with them and they show them things. And, uh, you know, the kid has to respond, even though they don't really know how yet they'll, they'll say words and they'll start doing it that way. And it turns out surprise, surprise, that's how you learn a language. And we've known this for a long time, at least since the seventies, we know that taking tests and learning in a classroom format is a horrifyingly bad way to learn a language. What you should do is learn it in the same way that a kid does. Uh, we just, they just start speaking it. Yeah. And they have people speak it to them in very simple terms. Right. I watched this video by this guy, uh, a professor. I forget, I forget what school he's a professor at. Um, it's an hour long video and it's amazing. And he, he breaks all this down. He basically says that, that the way Spanish is taught is absurdly wrong. And we've known it's wrong for a very, very long time. Uh, we just teach it that way because it's very convenient for a school format. And then we invoke the magical brain explanation for why it doesn't work. Uh, but basically you should do that. You should find someone to, you know, a, a language partner and have them speak to you like they're speaking to a kid. You can use a magazine and like point to things and communicate that way. Do exactly what a kid does. And he lays out a bunch of techniques to do it. Uh, and then in the latter half of the video, he does it. He, he already knows like six languages and he learns Arabic, which for an English speaker is as God tier difficult as you can find, but he does it. He just shows footage of him doing this process. And by the end of it, he's fluent in Arabic because it works. Uh, <laughs> and I guess the way this ties in is the mentality that you have, the approach that you take has these wildly different outcomes. Uh, you thinking that, I don't know how seriously you thought this or if you even thought about it at all, but the, oh, my brain doesn't really work with electronics. Your approach to electronics has been wrong or you just haven't wanted to learn and that's, that's fine. Um, but we constantly make up these ridiculous explanations for things like that. Like, oh, my brain just doesn't work that way. Because we, we don't acknowledge that there is a, a, a fundamental difference in the way somebody approaches something. And that is what determines how they learn it or how well they learn it versus not. At, at my job, every, every day, well, pre-COVID, every day at three o'clock, the artists would go for a walk. And our job is right next to a Publix. And so we just walk down to the Publix and then we, you know, get a drink or whatever. And then we come back. Well, one day, you know, I'm walking with the, the senior artist and we, we walk past the, the wine bottles and there was one with a label that was, it was gorgeous. It looked, it, it had this super ornate drawing on it and it was just, it was amazing. So I picked it up and I said to him, I said, man, how would you go about doing this? I don't even know. I wouldn't even know where to start. And he, he actually got angry at me. And he said, what the hell do you mean? How would you do it? You just do it. And that surprised me so much. And I have not been able to stop thinking about that when I go to do something. Because maybe just starting art so late in my life, I treat it differently than maybe mm -hmm. he did uh because he's been doing art since he was you know three years old or something it, it's never a question of how do you do it how, how do you do it the right way it's oh, I'll, I'll just do it because it, it's like this language i speak 
Yeah. Um, but me, I'm always hesitant to do things. I'm afraid to do it the wrong way, just like any adult in any of your lessons. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I'm looking at this thing. How do you how do you do it the right way? And he's just, what the hell do you yeah, mean? Like... By that? <laughs> just just do it. And I think it's it's the same thing with languages. Um, you don't try to think of the perfect way to learn it in in books and you know mm -hmm. the definition of each term. You just start speaking it. You you just jump into it. And you just do it. Yeah, there's almost this unhealthy reverence for things i think that people have sometimes you, know, you, you see a, a, that's a, a good way of putting it yeah yeah like you see a musician who's amazing and and of course you should admire them and respect them but it can almost create this like impenetrable aura of oh i'm i'm but a humble learner i can't approach you know their magnificence exactly. but no they're just they're a person who learned in the same way that that you would if you have the right mental approach to it is that they just start doing stuff and their music sucked at first and they made it better and they tried stuff and eventually it gets to be really good uh but this kind of worshipful uh this sacred art and i i'm not worthy not that people think of it in that exact sense but you you get that feeling sometimes i feel it myself for certain things okay so when i was learning art a, a couple years in um i, I never I never knew that many people, but I was a part of this tiny little forum. Uh, it was called conceptart.org that has since died, and, and there's some big drama. Everybody left it. Anyway, nobody I'm cares. So, I'm sorry. But but I, I had a, a couple friends on the forum that I met, and, and we would share our art and critique each other, and it was great. And uh, one time I did this piece, and someone – it was sort of an architectural piece – and someone commented on it and said, oh, man, that, that's amazing. How did you do that? Uh, you're so good at architecture. And I started explaining it to him, explaining what I, what I did, how I did it and everything. And it really made me feel like I was an authority on the subject. And in, until that moment, I kind of felt the same about everything that I was, you know, learning architecture, learning characters, learning lighting, learning all this, all this stuff. But when he said that, it kind of changed. I started thinking of myself as, oh, I'm really good at architecture. Um, <laughs> I, I know something about architecture or yeah. how to draw it or whatever. And I, I didn't realize this, but looking back now, whenever I do architectural drawings or pieces that involve a lot of architecture, I don't, I don't second guess myself. I just, I trust myself and I do it. And it usually turns out pretty good. When I do characters and stuff, I, I don't have that. Um, I second guess everything. Mm -hmm. I'm real self-conscious about it. And I work way harder on that stuff than I do the architectural stuff. I, it, it's really strange. It's this totally different way of approaching it. And I think it goes all the way back to just that one person's comment it, it sort of changed my view yeah. on who I am as as an artist. I forget why I started saying that, but um, no, I I have seen that exact thing. I I think it is very similar to the first one in the game thing, where something creates this mental picture that you have of yourself. That that made me feel like I was the first one in the game for architecturally related things. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I do not feel like that for some of the other aspects we so sam and i moved to portland somewhere around six years ago i think five or six years ago and you know you get to a new city we'd only been here for a week or so beforehand at some point so it, it's new we don't really know don't know anybody don't know what's around and you have this feeling of kind of being lost and just not really sure where to go what to do anything like that and we we met this couple who uh you know, they had just gone to a restaurant and we'd, you know, talk to them and go, oh, you know, what, what restaurants are good? Where, where should we go? I think, oh, you, you know, this one's really cool. And, oh, this is a nice spot. And, oh, you should go here and talk to this person. And they, they kind of, they introduced us to some people and it created, you know, we, we're looking at them like the experts, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're not, we're certainly not recommending anything to them. You know, we're just kind of new and not sure what to do. Uh, 
and and we've been friends for a long time since then but we found out like years later that they had actually moved to portland about a month before we did they were almost exactly as new as as we were uh they just had been here slightly longer and we approached them in this oh what's good what what's around here what should we do and they gave us advice and it just as easily could have gone the other way but that mentality persisted for a long period of time of oh we should ask them what what we got to do or what restaurants get uh, i think it's very similar to that somebody gives you a compliment or or even not even a compliment necessarily but just asks you something and it puts you in this mindset of oh yeah well, i i know some stuff about architecture and then that's right. just you from then on yeah, I kind of wish he had just complimented everything. Um, <laughs> well, it might not have worked. But, right, and I don't know if that's really why I tend to be better at that or not, but I think that might be the case. I just, I, I never feel insecure about that that type of work. Yeah, um, Here, here's an example of it kind of going wrong a little bit. Uh, I remember in high school, I was, I think, a freshman. I just joined the tennis team. I'd, I'd played tennis before, but not not super seriously uh and i i was with the team and, and we had the coach there and everything and i my swing was very simple i guess like i would just kind of hit the ball in this very flat kind of unexciting way i guess uh and the coach was coaching me on it and saying oh you you should move to you know a more western grip and try to generate more topspin where you you kind of bring the racket up really quickly it, it kicks the ball forward causes it to spin uh, and the spin does some good things it causes the ball to kind of dip in uh, instead of you know sail out out of bounds and it causes it to bounce it's basically just acknowledged as like a better a better type of swing to have uh and i remember i was kind of trying and wasn't wasn't really getting it or wasn't getting comfortable I'm like Ugh, this isn't really working and then i sat down on the bleachers and another teammate was sitting in front of me and he was talking to the coach and he didn't know I was there and he said man what are we going to do about Mike like you told him to do the top spin but you know he's just not not listening or not getting it you know like ugh it's so stupid and i overheard that and i'm a you know socially anxious person to begin with so that just burrowed right into my brain in fact i think it's one of my few memories of high school uh and so from then on, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta develop this Western grip. I gotta, you know, and I, that immediately became like more is better, more is better. And I remember the season ended practice over the summer. And I came back with this wild, ridiculous, like twisted around grip, like the most extreme grip you have ever seen. And I was good at topspin, but it wasn't, it wasn't a very good way of playing, but that became my identity from that point, uh, or this I'm. I'm the topspin guy, like uh, topspin is good and that's what I got to do. And it actually, I had to learn uh, how to reverse that a bit. And it took a long time. I was so used to playing with this really extreme grip style. Um, so you sort of like overcompensated? Way, and... way overcompensated. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's just an example of something similar to this, where somebody tells me something, it becomes this oh, this is my approach to the game. I'm this guy with this wild forehand topspin thing. And it actually went right. really bad. Uh, I think if you think of the um, this whole, you know, going into this, this game chat room or whatever you call it, waiting room for the game. If you think of, I don't know, I, I think it's like that for any room that you walk into. As soon as you walk into a room, you immediately size everyone up and you just subconsciously, you take on this role or this identity of who you are and you act accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't have any good examples, but you know, well, if, we, if we you walk it. into your own home and you have, you know, your party going on, you act like the host. If you walk right. into your friend's house and it's their house, you act like the guest. It's just, yeah. You immediately take on this identity. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. Well, with this, no. But... So that makes. I've said before that I I had and still have a pretty serious problem with social anxiety, uh, and I w I would go to a party, 
or at any kind of social event and have a really hard time knowing how to interact. You know, I would look at somebody who was really outgoing and, and loud and funny and I'd think, ah, I gotta, that's what I gotta do. That's clearly the thing that works, but I just can't get there because I'm not comfortable. It's very hard to be funny and outgoing when you're extraordinarily uncomfortable. Um, but there have been other times where I've hosted a party, not from my own, uh, I did not volunteer to host it, but let's say Sam really wanted to put on a party and I'm like dreading it because I'm scared of parties, but I, I wind up having to take the host role and that utterly changed everything because suddenly I have a completely different approach. I'm not right. trying to be hilarious and trying to get myself into that mentality that I can't do anyway, or maybe I could if I was much more comfortable. I'm instead thinking, oh, I'm a host, so I should ask people if they have something to drink and if somebody walks in the door, I got to go, you know, welcome right. them in. You and... have a role to play. Yeah. And suddenly the mentality is utterly different. And my ability to function and do well, so to speak, in that environment became dramatically better. And then it hit me. Oh, I could just pretend to be the host <laughs> if I'm at a party. Nobody, nobody's going to be upset about that. I can just go, hey, you want a drink? You want, you know... You want something to eat? You should try this. I can open, I can talk to people in the door. And actually it works amazingly well for me that that mentality shift. But again, it, right. it was an accident at the start. So, well, this makes me think of say students attending school. They get into this student mindset yeah. where they're going to wait and receive information that's given to them. And and that's it. They they don't need to go find the information. The teacher has the information. Well, and in fact, often enough, you're, I mean, that's how you're supposed to do it. You aren't supposed to go find your information. You get stuck in this, uh, I don't know, student teacher thing, and you you will treat your entire education that way. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. Um, I was I was the kid that didn't care that much about school. You know, I liked my friends better they were more interesting and so i just i never approached i don't know it that mindset just stayed with me through yeah. my entire education and it wasn't until i got out of school that i started learning things yeah um, i i that i think brings us maybe to the a bigger point here is that i've seen this as a teacher you th you think that your job as a teacher is to transfer information from yourself to the student. And certainly that is part of what you're doing. But I would say the, the biggest single factor that determines how well a student is going to do over a long period of time is their mentality, their, their mental approach to something. If they have that, you know, I'm here looking for answers, figuring things out, going after stuff that's infinitely more important than you telling them you know some right technique or you should hold your hand this way instead of that way or use this finger instead of that finger like that stuff is trivial compared to developing the right mental approach for them and a mistake that i see a lot from and i've done this myself this is something i had to learn the hard way i guess is your instinct when you have a student is to just correct every problem that you see. You know, if they're playing guitar and they haven't played much, you go, oh, you know, you need to kind of, you know, hold your hand a little bit more this way and make sure you, you know, do this and that and, you know, hold the pick like this and, you know, oh, you missed a note here. Let's go back and fix that. You tend to just barrage them with information. And that can be so damaging to their approach to the instrument where it, it puts them in a position where they're just sitting there trying to correct all of the things that you're telling them and they're becoming a bit of a robot in the sense that they're just following instruction and trying to do what it is you're telling them to do. And that's exactly the opposite of what you want to have happen with them. You want them to just try things and, and figure things out for themselves. And you, you do want to guide them. I'm not saying your job is to sit there and say nothing, but the guidance, here's what I think it ought to look like. You know, imagine that their first day there and you say let's play smoke on the water and you know you have them just plinking through a couple notes and let's say that 
you know, they're they're putting their fingers in the back of the frets and, you know, it's buzzing and sounding bad. Your instinct is to say, okay, no, you need to press your finger right here, right next to the, you know, the metal fret. And that's that's what makes it sound better. And you need to pluck this way and you start doing these things. But rather than that, I think the guidance you want to give them is, hey, listen to me play it. Then you play it. And say, okay, now you play it. Like, do you hear something wrong? Like, do you hear a difference? You know, oh yeah, it's, I hear like this buzzy sound. It doesn't sound bad. Like, okay, see if you can figure out why that's happening. See if you can make it sound like mine. And then you just sit there and relax and accept the fact that it might take them a little while to figure it out while they sit there and they play and they experiment and they try to figure out but what causes this sound. You're trying to teach them to solve problems. Yeah, you're trying to teach them that, you know, one, let's recognize what problems are and, and acknowledge that like we want to fix them and then you go fix it and and try it and, and do different things figure out how to solve that problem but if you just give them an answer to a problem without letting them push through a problem on their own again you're doing that thing you're you're causing them to be the second one in the game not the first one in the game where they're just they're relying on you they're doing what you tell them that that is really good and and it it should mirror perfectly into the the student side of it mm -hmm. is that's how you should treat learning a new skill is you should be both an observer and a problem solver yeah yeah um yeah, again your your te unfortunately sometimes you will get a teacher who is not good at this uh and the the two steps to solving that problem are one i guess talk to them say hey i think this might work better and if that doesn't seem to work, then you just need a new teacher. But uh, honestly, it just that it is such an important yeah. thing. Uh, although, if you are aware of it, then you can work on it on your own. I mean, if you sit at home and you go to play, you can make sure that you have the right approach where you explore and try things, and you know, don't be afraid to to break stuff. And then, you know, just time alone away from instruction can be a good place to really exercise that that mindset. So. All right, I, I wanna go back real quick. We were talking about how you can, uh, you can hold like one belief through, through your whole life and mm -hmm. think you're really bad at something and then kinda that can change if you just change your mindset and then get really good at it. You yeah. sent me uh, that, that video by um, uh, Penguify, right? Is that his name? I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think. I think his screen name is Penguin Fight. We'll anyway, put a we'll, link we'll in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. But this guy was really bad at learning. Was it uh, capitals of? Yeah, country. He was trying to learn the capitals of all 195 countries, and he was trying to do it like with pure recall, where you see a country and then you can like type out correctly spelled the capital of that country, which is very hard. Yeah. But uh, apparently, he was horrible at this in school. And people would kind of make fun of him, and he felt really insecure about it, and he was just horrible at it. And then someone out, out of school, he's, I don't know what age he is, but anyway, kind of grew up a little bit. Someone uh, challenged him to learn all of these capitals, and he took it on, and he actually became incredible at it. Yeah. He holds like the the top score of of being able to recall all of those things in this game. Mm -hmm. uh, I just I thought that was really incredible and just such a good example of how you might have these long standing beliefs of how you're you know oh I'm really bad at at capitals or I'm really bad at math I'm really bad at electronics and cars I'm bad at all this stuff, but that's not actually true. It's just Oh, you've never approached it the right way or a different way. Yeah, I if nothing else that comes out of this talk, I guess, I just want to acknowledge how vitally important your mental approach is to something. And sometimes it takes shape over the most trivial of things. Something that someone says to you, the fact that you loaded up 15 minutes before someone else did like there's so many little tiny things that can create this sometimes lifelong either skill or lack of or whatever like it can affect you over such a long period it, of time yeah, yeah. It changes who you think you are yeah and again 
it's not magic. Stop invoking age or the brains are different. Like that, none of that stuff means anything. Like there is something different about the way a kid approaches something versus an adult or why you got good at this one thing versus something else. And yeah, sometimes people just don't like stuff and that's fine. They don't want to get into it. If you don't want to learn about cars, that's, that's perfectly okay. But let's acknowledge but don't how say vital you that can't is. do it. Right. Just say, I don't want to. Yeah. Right. Not you can't. Yeah. All right. I think, is that what we want to say? Anything else to add? I, I, yeah, I have one really dumb story. Okay, it, let's do it. You know how we told ourselves, no matter how dumb the metaphor was, we were still going to say it? Yes. This All is right, a safe so, space, kind of. What? It's a safe space. Yeah. All right. So today... We were driving around. I'm in the passenger seat of the car. And, uh, you know, the sun's kind of going down. There's, you know, the evening sun going through the trees. It's real beautiful. Um, you know, the shadows are go going across my face. It's just such a wonderful, beautiful day. Weather's perfect. And I'm looking out the window. And uh, we're, we're driving through this neighborhood. And just for a couple seconds, I see something really weird. I see this kid. He's like 10 or 12 years old. He's holding this giant real sword that's, I mean, it's bigger than him. He's holding Excalibur and he's <laughs> smashing pumpkins, he, these huge pumpkins. He's just, I mean, full body swings, just smashing these pumpkins How and they're just kid? flying to bits. And I just, I had no idea what was happening, but it was just this real, you know, quick passing thing. And what it made me think of after a little bit of trying to process what I was seeing is, well, it's, it's basically February now. Um, those pumpkins probably came from Halloween, which was many months ago, mm -hmm. right? So they, they've probably just been sitting around. Uh, no one's, even, they've probably gotten to the point where they don't even see them anymore. Uh, they're just sitting there and, until mom finally realizes Mm -hmm. Oh, we have pumpkins here. Hey, Tommy, go go get rid of these pumpkins. And he takes out his sword and annihilates <laughs> them. But it, it made me start thinking about all of these very long-held beliefs that we have and how we, we don't even notice them anymore. And they've completely shaped our lives. And, I mean, I have books in my closet that I've planned to read for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably plan to read them for another 10 years. Um, but... It, I don't want to do that. I want to take those those long held beliefs and grab Excalibur and smash them and just destroy them, and and start seeing things in a new way. Right. Okay. You need to get rid of pumpkins. Why not use a sword to do it? Yeah. So start smashing pumpkins. I guess is right. my. All right. I love that. My summary. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's all I got. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, if you're on a podcast platform, we'd love to have a review or a comment or anything you, you want to send us. You can email us at the overanalyzers podcast at gmail.com. You can leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, thanks everybody. We will see you next week.